Today's general theme is the modeling of human reasoning. Uh, let me first recall for our students a, a thing that I have explained in the general introduction on Monday morning, which is Mars' trichotomic theory of explanations. And according to Mars' theory, and it's something that, is, that has lasted and lasted for years after year, we, we need three kinds of explanations, physical explanations, the one that explained the material structure underlying procedures. For us on, in the study of reasoning, it is the neurological hardware of the brain when we are reasoning from the standpoint of the natural sciences. There are also algorithmic explanations. They explain the successive procedures that are realized in an action. In the study of reasoning, this means the, men, the study of the mental operations that reasoners perform from the standpoint of, of the psychological and social sciences. A third family of explanations are the explanations, the computational ones. They explain the underlying formal structures that are at work in the procedures. In the study of reasoning, this means the modeling of the rules at work in reasoning from the standpoint of the formal sciences, logic, mathematics, computer science, and so on. So usually it stands in between the two other types. On June 20th and 21st, I would say that the dominant standpoint was about algorithmic explanations. And this is why most of the studies that, we, uh, that have been introduced during these two days were from psychologists of reasoning. Vinod Goel, in the keynote lecture Monday night, uh, introduced a standpoint that was mainly about physical explanations, given that he's a neuroscientist. Today, on June 22nd, we will be, I would say, in between algorithmic and computational explanations. We'll have more computational, more directly computational standpoints next week. <clears throat> okay. The modeling of human reasoning should take into account that reasoning is a component of our cognitive and social activity. So reasoning is a mix of different things. These are topics that were introduced yesterday and the day before, but they were very important today. Those different things like logic, beliefs, communication and social procedures, and deliberations for action. Today we'll have four standpoints on the functions of reasoning in our cognitive activity. First, we'll have Jean-François Bonnefond, who will take the standpoint of human reasoning as a reading of the mind of the others about their preferences. Then Guy Politzer, it will be a very French morning, except <laughs> a German part. German. Yeah. Guy Politzer will be more in the perspective of human reasoning as a qualitative estimation of the probability of a conclusion, which is very close, of course, to what we have seen yesterday with the Bayesian approach. Henri Furbach, my, my German is not perfect, <laughs> will take the stance of human reasoning as question answering. And this afternoon, Keith Stenning and Mikhail van Lambalgen will take the standpoint of reasoning as closed world reasoning. They will explain. I will make a short introduction in a few minutes. In a non-monotonic dynamics. Okay. I have two uh, technical announcements to, to, to make. First, Mikhail van Lambalgen could not be with us, but he works very closely with Keith Stenning. And so Keith Stenning will present his lecture and the lecture of Van Lambagen. Thank you, Keith, for this. And the other thing is that Terry Stewart, who was planned to be next week with, in the session on cognitive architectures, could not be with us next week. He can be with us now. So this afternoon, we'll have a, an extra presentation, uh, the lecture of Terence Stewart at 4.15 after the, the afternoon break, break, okay? So Terence Stewart lecture that was scheduled for next week in the cognitive architecture part will be 
added this afternoon at 4.50. Okay, I'm coming back to my short uh, introduction PowerPoint document. Okay, Jean-Francois Bonfond is from Toulouse School of Economics. So he will talk about reasoning about preferences and mainly of reasoning about preferences as a form of mind reading. That is, the mind reading is what the, the name for the way we attribute beliefs and desires to others. And as he will explain to us, it is very important in our social life. Reasoning as, a think, as thinking of others and their goals. This is the, mainly the standpoint, if I understand what he will do. And so he will present the connectives and the quantifiers, which is very different from traditional formal logic. The connectives and the quantifiers as functions of the preferences of the speaker and the listener. It will be very exciting, I'm sure. Then we'll have Guy Politzer, Université de Paris 8. He will present an analogical model for deduction under uncertainty. This is close to what we've seen with the Bayesian approaches. There is much non-monotonicity in human reasoning and this is based on the uncertainty of, in our knowledge. He proposes a reorientation of the psychology of reasoning from the paradigm of classical logic to a Bayesian approach. He raises a problem. Bayesian probabilities are much too complex for the modeling of lay persons' reasoning. Then he proposes an, an analogical model for the qualitative estimation of the conclusion of, the, of an inference. Then we'll, ha we'll have Rurik Furba. My assistant Jenny Brisson has heard a lecture from him last year, and she came back to UCOM and she said, well, Professor Robert, you have a German friend, but you don't know him yet. <laughs> so now I know him. Okay, I'm sorry. And he, uh, Professor Furba is from Koblenz University. He proposes an automated reasoning system for cognitive computing. So this. This is one of the talks that make us move a little forward in the dimension of computational explanations. But other talks today will be also moving a little in that direction. So it will use the uh, first order automated reasoning in question answering and cognitive computing. It, will, it works on the modeling of natural language quest, question answer, answering via automated reasoning. And his main, main goal is to bridge the gap between human and automated reasoning. <clears throat> okay, before I say a few words on standing in Van Lambergen, I want to transfer to you a message from uh, Jonathan Evans. He's very uh, happy that we, we could have his lecture through my, my voice yesterday. And he's a very, uh, I would say, humble person, but he has written an important book, so I told him that I will mention the book. In the, say, the last part of his talk, he mentioned, uh, of course, the very important book by uh, Keith Stanovich, The Robot's Rebellion. But there is another book that goes exactly in the same direction, that is the, the last dimension, the, the recent dimension of uh, dual processes theory, which is the, the passage from two processes to two minds. And uh, Jonathan has written a wonderful book that is uh, Thinking Twice, two minds in one brain. So this is a very important reference and much of what he's, he said through my voice in the last part of, of the lecture was related to this book by Jonathan Evans. Okay, now this afternoon we'll have the, the, something of the work of Keith Stenning and Michael van Lambalgen by uh, Keith Stenning. And the standpoint is, is reasoning as a discourse process and mainly reasoning as a treatment of our information in the context of a discursive activity. I have to make a short parenthesis. Okay, we have discussed yesterday and Monday uh, often of people committing fallacies from a logical standpoint. That is, most of the time, human beings spontaneously reason according to their beliefs. And this is what we call, as we have said yesterday, the belief bias much more according to their beliefs than according to the formal structure of the inference. Okay, so this way, 
the, the think that a conclusion is logically valid while it is not. There is also another very important phenomenon, and I refer to a 1989 art, uh, paper by Ruburn, which is very important. It is the, the opposite phenomenon, could we say. That is, the suppression of valid inferences. So people happen to make valid inferences, and all of a sudden, in a different context, they do not draw the valid conclusion, but they have cognitive reasons to do so. The, the classical, uh, and I think this paper was very, very import, important in the history of the psychology of reasoning. And so the classic example is, goes as follows. Let's take a simple modus ponens. You say to, to participants, if Mary has a textbook to read, she will study late in the library. She has a textbook to read. So what's the conclusion? And almost everybody will say, well, she will stay late. She will study late in the library. Okay, then we go with another modus ponens. If the library is open, Mary will study late in the library. And the library is open. So what's the conclusion? And people will say, well, she will study late in the library. Then, in a third inference, we go back to the first one. If Mary has a textbook to read, she will study late in the library. She has a textbook to read. So what's the conclusion? From a strictly logical standpoint, with these only two premises, she can make the, 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 the participants should make the modus ponens and say, well, she will study late in the library. But people do not uh, do the modus ponens. They consider that, well, it depends if the library is open or not. So the, the, the sentence that says, the minor premise that says uh, the, the library is open is not considered as an alternative antecedent. It's considered as an additional premise, uh, as an additional part in the antecedent of the, of the conditional. So people consider that if Mary has a textbook to read, and if the library is open with these two conditions, then she will study late in the library. And this is why they made a suppression of the inference. So it, this, this phenomenon is such that we call the, the, the fact that the library it could be closed a disabler, something that, makes, that disables the, the, the valid inference, the modus ponens. Okay, I'm telling this because in the work of Keith Tenning and Michael Van Lambalgen, it's, very, it's something very important. I would say that much of the theory of reasoning that they, they developed depends on that and tries to explain that. So it happens that there are disablers in logical reasoning. Let's refer to Bern 1989. So Tenning and Van Lambalgen developed the theory of closed world reasoning. What do we do not know as being true is implicitly considered as being false. If I say uh, tomorrow, if it's sunny tomorrow, we'll have a picnic at Parc La Fontaine. And if tomorrow it's sunny, you will go to Parc La Fontaine. You won't wonder, well, maybe the end of the world might happen. Uh, Serge might have broken his leg. Uh, maybe there was an explosion and there's no more Parc La Fontaine in Montreal and so on. You won't do that. So Stenning and Van der Magen say, well, what is not explicitly known as true is considered as being false. So this way, when we reason, and their standpoint is that it's necessary for our living in society, we close the world in reasoning. So instead of, think of representing in, in, in our mind, if P then Q, as a conditional, as a classical conditional, we understand if P then Q the, the, the way it, the, this following way. If P and nothing abnormal, the negation of AB, nothing abnormal, then Q. And if we consider that something abnormal has occurred, for example, you, you learned that I broke my leg or the, the, that the library is closed, we tend to suppress the valid inference. And this way to open our world, but partly, just a little more than before. Okay, so this way, their conclusion is that we do not have a tendency to reason as classical logic tells us. We reason more in a non-monotonic way than in a classical way. <clears throat> we, read, <clears throat> we read conditionals <clears throat> this way. 
if p and nothing abnormal than q. And their conclusion is that this way we're not classically competent in our everyday reasoning, but we're cognitively competent via credulousness. I mean, there is a part of credulity in our mental functioning which is important for us to survive collectively. But uh, Keith Stanning will explain much more and much better these things this afternoon while he talk about his research with uh, Mikhail van Lambargen. 